Welcome everyone to the fifth tutorial of a, a deep learning course. Today we will discuss um, deep convolutional neural networks, so modern CNN architectures as you have seen in the lecture. And the ones we concentrate today on are GoogleNet, WestNet and DenseNet. Probably you have heard of all of them, because GoogleNet has been the winner of the ImageNet challenge in 2014, WestNet 2015 and DenseNet is also a very popular architecture which has won the best paper award in CVPR 2017. And all of them are actually still relevant for state-of-the-art architectures uh, in, well, today. And this is why it's also important to have actually implemented them yourself, that you have understood how you can implement them, what benefits they have, and therefore we will do it here. In addition, we will also introduce a new uh, package to PyTorch, which is PyTorch Lightning, which will make our job quite uh, a lot easier to reduce code overhead for logging, saving, and so on, as you have seen in the previous tutorials. So let's get started again first with importing our usual uh, libraries. There's nothing new to it. We have here our Torch, PyTorch um, packages, and then here again our Torch Vision packages. We say again one anyway, and then import just our standard um, packages. The cell below you also already know we just set our paths for the data set with checkpoint and set the seed so that we can reproduce everything. And we have here again a couple of pre-trained models which we can just download. Next, we will uh, then make sure that we can actually normalize our data because we have seen that it is actually important to have our input data normalized with a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. And this we simply do by taking the data set, so here we will use the, uh, Cypher 10 throughout the notebook and calculate the mean and standard deviation for the whole data set. And this, is, this we do basically independently of our channels, so we calculate it for the green, red and blue channel independently. What we can do then here, so first of course it has to download the data set and then we can just assume that these will be now our mean and standard deviation values we will use to actually normalize. Then below we will load our data set um, and there we will already see some difference. So the test transformation is the transformation we have seen. So we take an image, put it into a tensor and then normalize it, um, which we will, so overall our task will be again classification and here we will do classification on Cypher 10. This test transformation is the transformation we have also used really before for um, Fashion MNIST. While well, now doing training, we will add a bit of augmentation. So if, as you know, uh, deep neural networks tend to overfit on the training data, especially if the training data is small. And therefore we augment the data, so we take the images, do slight uh, changes, but they are not identical, but we know that the semantics of the content and the class is the same. This helps for regularizing. And what we do here is the first one is a random horizontal flip. So we take an image and horizontally flip it in 50% of the cases because the object doesn't change with it. And we use what we call here a random resized crop. It's nothing else than taking the image, resizing it. We actually change also a little bit the ratio. So we can have different scaling in horizontal and vertical direction and then crop it again into our size or image size of 32 times 32. And this we only do during training because this gives us randomness and we don't want it in test time or so on because in test time we want the two images and don't have always different test scores if we want the test again. It would be also noisy and doesn't allow us to actually do it. So let's load the data sets here as well. Just to verify that we actually have done the correct job in calculating the mean and standard deviation, we can uh, load the batch and check um, the mean and the standard, standard deviation just in the batch. That's always a good practice just to check that it actually does what you intend to do. And you should see scores close to one for the mean and the standard deviation as well. As we, ah yeah, right, sorry, the mean should be of course zero, as you see here, and the standard deviation is here now close to one. We can also now visualize, so for random augmentations, let's just maybe visualize a few images so you get the intuition what actually happens. 
So you see that, for example, these two images have been horizontally flopped, uh, flipped. So the first row here shows the augmented images, the second row the original images. So these have been, for example, flipped, the other ones have not. And you see also, especially with this truck, that we have rescaled the image and then we cropped. So it's still the same truck, but it has a little bit different pixel values, which make it a little bit harder for the network to overfit on the training data. After having set up everything, we can now look at the new PyTorch package, namely PyTorch Lightning. So PyTorch Lightning is a library which is designed to take a lot of coding for logging, for model saving, all the standard um, operations away from you and allows you to then, then just focus on what you need uh, to do to actually implement it and also makes your code very readable. And if you would share your code, basically everyone knows where to look for what things. That's why we use it here and probably also use it throughout all our other notebooks um, because it's just a good thing to do. But remember, in case you do really research and want to change fundamental things in, for example, optimization, then the framework like PyTorch Lightning is not designed for that, then, for example, just use simple PyTorch. So first of all, we will have to install PyTorch Lightning on Colab in case you use your local computer and are running it with our environment. You should see that it's already installed and therefore just imports it. One nice thing is that PyTorch Lightning already provides us a function to seed everything. Therefore, we will not have to write our own function of set seed, um, which, for example, shows already how it can benefit us here. PyTorch Lightning defines a new module. So instead of just having nn.modules, we define now a wrapper around it, which is called the Lightning module. The Lightning module um, basically says, OK, our model has to define five functions. First, of course, our initialization, so how, um, how we create our model. Second is a function called configure optimizers. So there we, for example, have to decide um, how our optimizers should look like, so which optimizer we use, which learning rate, etc. We have also then the training step, validation step, and test step. So the training step or each of these steps are basically functions that are called in the respective loops. So in the training step, for example, in the training loop, you get with in the function then a batch and a batch I index if you want it, and basically have to return the loss on which it should be back propagated. Well, the validation step and test step should then uh, lock, for example, the test accuracy, the validation accuracy, any metrics you need for validation and testing. So let's, for example, have a look at a simple module which would implement our training on Cypher. We, we see, so the input arguments, I just defined here a couple. We have a model name, we have an optimizer name, and then hyperparameters for each of them. In PyTorch Lightning, you can just say self.save hyperparameters, and what it does, it creates a namespace called self.hparams. So the one you see down here is basically created by this operation, and it takes all the input arguments and stores it here into a namespace. So you see now we, we can access .optimizer name down here, which is the input argument from up here. It also provides us when, when we save a model, it actually saves a YAML file with all the hyperparameters, which will uh, give us a much easier time to load again a model and test it, for example. Then we create here our model, our loss function. And what we do here is we define an example input array, meaning what, for example, could be an input to the model. And this is used for plotting, so we will see We'll use here TensorBot. TensorBot is a plotting uh, platform from TensorFlow, uh, which is also very good and therefore also has a good support also in PyTorch. And there you can, for example, visualize the computation graph. And if we define here example input array, basically this is the input when it visualizes the computation graph. We define, we can define here forward function, which is called when we use this example input array. So we just push them through the uh, model. The configure optimizers function, as I said, defines here the optimizer. So we, for example, choose between Adam or SGD. And we also use here a learning rate um, schedule so that we can, uh, for example, change our learning rate along the way. So especially when 
Later, what we defined here is we have a multi-step learning rate decay. So after 100 epochs, we reduce it by 0.1, so 1 divided by 10. And after 150 epochs, we again divide it by 10. And this helps a special optimizer to find this really uh, optimum in the training set. In the training step, as I said, we now take a batch, which is basically our images and labels. We just have to say, we take our predictions, we calculate the loss, for example, take the accuracy. We can already see, we can just lock different metrics. So for example, I say, I want to lock the training accuracy and we'll then later see it in my tensor board, which we will also run here. And also the training loss, which is returned to do the backward one. The validation step then here is, for example, just predicting the accuracy, logging it as val validation accuracy and testing exactly the same here. There you see that we just have a very structured code now. Everyone uh, can, for example, look at just the training step if they are interested in how did you actually train your model or just look at the validation or so on. Therefore, we can run it because we will also use that um, class later. In addition, PyTorch also has uh, more functionalities. One of them are called callbacks. Callbacks are uh, well, objects or classes that you define, and those are called along the way during training. So for example, two that are very popular and also predefined are learning rate monitor and model checkpoint. So the learning rate monitor is nothing else than logging our learning rate. We use a step uh, learning rate scheduler, therefore just a good practice to also log your learning rate along the training. So you know actually that your scheduler is doing what it is supposed to do. The model checkpoint is used to call then after an epoch and check whether you want to save your model and if you want to overwrite your model. So for example, we want to just save a best model, right? And therefore this is what the model checkpoint callback handles everything. So it looks at when do you want to save your model? How do you want it? What metric do you want to track and so on? So this is quite helpful. Uh, and if we want, for example, then more callbacks, we can just define our own. We use then uh, overall also here function um, because we will have different models and we will use the model name here, so a string, um, to identify which object we want to use. We don't pass for object because the string will be passed uh, as a hyperparameter and we don't want to save uh, basically a class object, but we want to rather save a string which is just nicer and works better. So let's do it also here. In the model dict, we will then fill with a name and for object, so the class um, of, of a model we want to use when, when we train. Similar thing we do here with our activation functions, as we have already seen. We just define here a bunch in case you want to play around with them. Now that we have a lighting module, another part of PyTorch Lightning is the trainer, and the trainer has two uh, function. It is quite similar also to Keras, in case you know that. So basically what we have is a trainer.fit and trainer.test. So we define basically an object with parameters on how to train the model and then can just say trainer.fit, take the model in, put uh, then the training data set and the validation data set and basically optimizes the model on the training set and checks then the validation set along the way. The trainer.test then takes a, a trained model and evaluates the model on a test data set. So this one calls then the test step while trainer.fit uses the training step and the validation step. I define then here a function how you can actually train your model. So what you do is you have a trainer object, pl.trainer, where you say the default root directory, so where do you want to store all the files a checkpoint callback, as you see, we use the model checkpoint now. We say we only want to save the weights, so we don't want to save, for example, optimizer, uh, the state dict. We want the mode of max because we monitor the validation accuracy, so the best model is the model which has the highest validation accuracy. Sometimes you want to track the loss, and therefore then you would use the mode of min. We say how many GPUs we want, so we, there you see we could already use multi um, well, multi GPU training, but here we just say we have one GPU if our device is cooler. 
We also have save in how many epochs we want to train here 180. It's also hyperprinted. You can play around the callbacks we have, which is I say here just a learning rate monitor which tracks per epoch. So per epoch we lock the learning rate and the progress uh, bar refresh rate is there in case um, you, for example, train on a cluster. We use so this trainer basically gives you a progress bar, and if you're on a cluster, you don't really see want to see the progress bar. So then you can set it to zero, or the Jupyter Notebook is not going well with a progress bar, you can change it here. We then have just here a little bit more code of saying if there exists a pre-trained model, then we just load it, and there you see we can just say load from checkpoint, and it already loads all the hyper primitives and everything by itself. Well, then here, if there's no pre-trained, we just um, basically create a new one and start training. And then we return here the results. That's basically all we need to do for PyTorch Lightning. And then we can already look at the different models we will implement here.